Hey everyone, welcome back to Beginning Fabrication. This is episode six, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello again, I, uh, I realised yesterday, yesterday was when we made those engine bay parts, um, that I showed you how to knock those little recesses in and then I just did the folds, I didn't really show anything about the folds because not everyone's going to have a folder, one of those things. Um, so I'm just going to show you what I used to do before I bought a folder. Um, I used to just make a cardboard template and take it down to the local sheet metal place and get them to fold it. So I'll just show you what I used to do in case it's uh, something that'll work for you. Cool. So rather than try and get a big piece of cardboard and then just cut the profile of the sill out and try and get it perfect, I find it easier to cut smaller pieces because I know that they're only a small sill so while I'm lying on the floor next to the car I'll actually just tape these together to get a rough sort of an idea that's roughly what the sill's going to look like it's a pretty basic profile that's the part that folds into the door opening that's the side of the sill that you can see from under the door and then there's the return underneath and then it'll have a little lip on the bottom so I'll just mark where that lip finishes and as I'm holding these next to the car I'll just put a bit of tape on them to, so they keep their shape um, and also it works well because I wanted to keep this piece because this is just another template I've got for marking where the seat holes go in the Monaro floor that I'm working on so I didn't want to chop that piece up okay let's go and make this template Okay, so I've just made the little cardboard template for the, the Tirana sill. So I've marked where it needs to finish at each end. You could call one a start, but I'll just write finish at both ends. And I also include a little measurement for how long the flat surface of this needs to be because the, the shop years ago when I used to not have a folder, um, they wanted me to measure the flat and not actually include the length in, in the radius because they'd use the template to determine what they need to add for the radius. So my little millimetre measurements here, I've measured off the car um, just off the radius, so where it starts to flatten out. So even though I've written 94 mil there, this is actually a few mil longer than that because I haven't measured the radius. But the, any shop that you get to fold parts for you, you just ask them how they want you to measure things or if they want you to measure them at all. If you can supply a template like this that fits properly, well then they might not even need the measurements. They can just go purely off the template. Um, so this is the, the face of the sill, the part that you see when you look at the side of the car. And that's the horizontal bit that goes underneath that you don't really see. And then there's a little 20 mil lip where it's joined to the floor under the car. So that's again, I've written finish because that's where the piece can finish. So that just fits over the, the sill like that. So it's a lot easier for me to make these templates out of separate pieces and tape them together at the right angle than trying to determine exactly how to cut these angles perfectly for it to, to fit over that without any gaps. Um, so that's why I use multiple pieces and a bit of tape. For me personally, I just find it easier. Um, this is for, if you're gonna actually get someone else to fold this up that doesn't have the car with them, 
you can hand them a physical thing and say I need it to fit inside of this and that way they have something to work on whereas if you're folding it yourself even if you know someone who's got a folder and you're going to go and do it yourself at their their place and when I do these jobs here I don't make a cardboard template because I've usually got the car here um, and that's when I'll use a sliding bevel even though it's adjusted a bit wrong back a bit you can also use a sliding bevel to make your template I just prefer to make my templates off the car straight off the car so that's my lower angle and so that's something that I'll I'll lock that up and then when I make the two sills I'll have that that angle for making this first fold underneath and then I'll reset it when I do the top one so that's the that's the easiest way to, to make a template if you're going to get somebody else to do your folds for you so hopefully that was that was useful well, actually another thing too that a shop will need to know if they're doing your folds is where the sill starts so this is the overall length and then where it finishes and also I've included this top little 20 mil piece here because even though it's not rusty um, I still like to get rid of it because it's probably got surface rust on it sometimes I'll go up to here if there is rust and other times I'll go right across but for this it just needs to go to here because by having this made as just a fold it's going to be dead straight which is good for your door gap because you're going to you can see this and welding in here it's easier to actually grind in a valley smooth after you've welded and there's a good chance that if you did weld it on this radius that it would end up having some wobble or distortion in it um, and because that ends where the door jam ends you could ask the steel shop to to trim from the back of the sill to there they could actually cut that return off if you wanted them to um, but more than likely they just put the fold on and it would be it would just go from front to back have that fold on it and you can just trim this little part out yourself and uh, that's really about all there is to to uh, getting the measurements and the, the shapes required for having someone else put the folds in a piece of metal for you cool Another little tip uh, is just in regards to cutting straight lines. I make a lot of steel cowl scoops and I don't have a guillotine so all of the cuts that I do are full width 1200 sheet and there's a lot of cuts so I, uh, I've got this thick wall angle and it's I don't know, six or seven mil thick, nice straight, straight edge. So I've got my two little measurements, I just line up and uh, clamp it on. This is probably one of the tools that I use the most in this shop really, the amount of cuts that I do because I don't have the space or the real the desire to have a guillotine in here. And then uh, I've now got a nice straight straight edge to cut against um, and I know that every time I do a cut it's going to be the same same straight line and it also takes especially doing a long cut it's so easy for, for you to, to wander with the with the grinder you know you might think you're going along okay but then if you if you go across half of your pencil line and then straighten it up and then eventually you go oh shit I'm just come back onto it well then you're going to have a lump and it just gets messy especially if you're trying to then weld those two ends together those two edges together to form a scoop so the straighter the line when you have the welder join the better and also when you do cut a piece off a full sheet you're left with a nice straight edge for the next time you need to cut something off the sheet so, and when I cut I'll do a, a really light scribe all the way along 
um, just to, to get my a groove in for the line. And then uh, I'll just slowly go back and forth until it's cut off. And I'll get quite a few of these 1200 mil long cuts out of, out of a lucky like, used disc. So I'll, uh, I'll just show you a little bit of that once I can find my glass. Again, yeah, there's nothing behind me that I've, I'm worried about throwing sparks at. So, always make sure your lead isn't going to get caught up on something. Um, quite often, especially when I'm working near a corner, I'll just try and keep an eye on, on the lead so that it doesn't get hung up because then that can wiggle and make your cut bent. So, pull it behind you and stick it on your shelf. So obviously I haven't cut that off yet. I just wanted to say when you're cutting something that's on a stand, just be wary of, of how you've got it on the stand for when it does drop off. Um, because this is only a, a small piece, it's only six inches, I can bring my panel stand up. So it's actually on that. So the weight of this, when I finish doing this cut, this will drop down and I can just hang on to this piece rather than it it dropping down. It's sort of I find it easier to control the piece of metal that's in front of me than the piece of metal that that's away from you. But I just want to make sure that I can lean on this enough so that as this gets cut through more, this is going to want to drop and that'll turn into a, a valley. And then potentially the two pieces can jam up your, your disc. So if I can keep pressure on that, it keeps this all nice and flat as I'm cutting. And then when it does cut through, this will drop down a little bit, but then I'll just have this piece will just be in my hand, nice and safe. So I'll keep going. thing which is a must do, obviously I've got gloves on so there's no harm in picking it up under there, but that's sharp, there's a really horrible burr, I don't know if you can really see how crusty that is, um, that'd open you up extremely easily. So before I do anything else I, I just use the cutting disc extremely lightly and I just go along and, and deburr that and then I'll go under this one and deburr this side so I'll do that now good to go. So I'll just show you one of the bits that I just deburred off. Where's the lensy thing? There we go. So I don't know if you can see that. That's um, basically a razor blade and so when you cut any steel you want to make sure that you get rid of these things and if you drill holes um, if you don't have a, a countersink tool to deburr it. Just go up a few sizes with the drill bit and just give the 
give the clean up, give the hole a clean up um, with a with a slightly bigger drill, just to to chamfer the edges and get rid of this this stuff because I don't know how much blood I've spilled because of these things. Oh, and also, you can see that for a hand hand cut thing that's relatively straight. So that's the the point of this tip. It's just if you need to do a cut that's quite long and you're not confident in um, how steady you can go with the, with the grinder, just set up a simple device that, that helps you out. And um, especially if you're doing multiple of the same length cut, like this piece of iron is a tool. It's not. It's not metal that I'll ever use. It, it's it's for doing this, and that's all it does. And these two clips, these two vice grips, are always just joined onto it. And this just sits sits against the wall. And every time I need it, it's there waiting, ready to go. So, um, and also I don't normally use cold rolled steel. I normally use zinc anneal because I'm in Queensland, which is humid and gross. And uh, you can see this side of the metal is quite clean. There's a bit of surface rust, but that's how it comes. But then in the week that this has been sitting here, as I've been using it as a bench, you can see how much rustier this side is because it's been more exposed to the moisture in the air. Um, but this is available, so I grabbed it. But I also thought it'd be good, I can show you later on how to clean the surface with both the clean and strip disc and also uh, phosphoric acid based rust converter. So we might actually uh, have a bit of a look at that right now. So I'll get some stuff ready and I'll be back. Okay, excuse my snottiness. It's, uh, it's Queensland winter, so even though it's probably summer for Tasmanians, it's cold here, so. Uh, I'll just show you how quickly the the clean and strip disc, even though this is an old, dirty, half worn out disc, it's still going to get rid of this surface rust nice and easily. And again, you don't want to hook up the edge of the piece. You always want to make sure that the, the disc is flowing off, off the job that way. Here it goes. giving that, I wasn't leaning on the grinder at all, I was literally letting the weight of the grinder clean the metal and I don't know if you can hear the difference, you can hear how rough the rusty surface is, it just cleans it up nicely. Now if you're going to use this on a job and you're going to weld this, because it's had the surface rust, I'd still rust convert it just to neutralise the steel. Um, but I'm going to do, I'll do a strip of rust converter just on this part before I even sand it and then I'll let it dry and you'll be able to see how quickly and effectively um, the acid works. But if you're going to work metal, it's always nice to clean it up before you work it. You don't want to get this rust on everything because it does transfer and it's messy and it stinks and you know, it's just not a nice thing to have all over you. So it's nice to clean up anything you're working with before you use it. But then, before you do any priming or anything like that, use the, the acid-based products to, to neutralise the metal. I'll just um, steal this off there. So you can see all of this. This is all the phosphoric acid and this whole car up on the hoist, that's all acid because it got delivered in bare metal in the rain. So the whole car was just brown and furry. So I'll, I'll put a bit of acid on this now and, uh, and I'll be back in a sec. Okay, ready to do rust converter. There's a few different brands available. Um, anything that's phosphoric acid based 
will do the job. Um, some of them ask you to clean the residue off with water, which just doesn't make sense to me. I use Oxitec, Antiox. Um, they don't pay me to use it. I bought this and I use it myself just because I really like it. It's good and it works really fast. Um, I've also used Plus brand, which is really good, but I, I really like dealing with Oxitec. Um, and they also do this solvent-based Easy Foss, which is really good if you've got clean metal and you've been working on and you want to go back the next day and do some more work on it without priming it. You can just dust a really thin coat of this over the top of it and it'll hold any surface rust at bay for a certain length of time. Um, and then you can either wipe off with thinners or just weld straight, straight over it. Um, it's just a cleaner way of keeping the metal clean and rust free as opposed to putting acid on it all the time. So that's another option too. I'll show you always just use crappy old paint brushes. You can put it in a spray gun and spray it on. Um, you can use a, a rag and wipe it on. I've just got a, an old paint cup. Now, if I'm doing a full car, I only put a small amount in because if you're painting something that's exceptionally surface rusty, you are going to contaminate the liquid each time you put the brush in. So you don't want to fill it right up, do a few passes with the brush and then contaminate a litre of, of uh, acid. So this has got a tiny bit in it. You can see how gross and dirty it is because I, I was rust converting something the other day and it got a bit contaminated. But for the sakes of this, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So you literally just brush it on and uh, walk away. So I've left a reasonably neat line so we can uh, we'll be able to see the, see the difference. One thing I find by using cheap crappy brushes, the acid, you can see how rusty it is because it's acid, eventually over time it kills it. So now that I've finished brushing that on, I'll just go and give this a rinse under the tap clean it up and it just makes these old cheapy brushes last a lot longer. Ta -da! So we're back at the rust converter. It's still wet because it's only been five minutes and you can see the difference in the colour. If I get the glare off, you can see how brown it started out. Obviously this part we sanded so that's clean but this part was exactly the same as that five minutes ago and uh, even though it's wet you can you can clearly see how much silverer it has become so rust converter is a product that I use a lot of because every time I cut open a, a sill or a lower quarter panel or a door or anywhere that's a cavity I'll, I'll wire wheel out inside as best as I can reach, coat it with this stuff and then etch prime it so that it's got a, a neutral steel and then a, a surface paint over the top of it because a lot of the internal cavities of, of cars didn't get painted because they, they put the bodies together um, before they painted them. So when you cut a sill off most cars, you'll generally find a ton of manolacomus, a ton of surface rust. Um, and that's where this stuff really comes into its own because you can literally paint it on. And, and if you leave it overnight so that it completely dries, um, which I'll do if I'm painting a whole car with it, I'll paint it one day. The next day I'll come in and sand it just to denib off if it's got quite a lot of active rust in the metal. It sort of comes up as like a weird powder. I don't know if you can see on. I'll just move this and give you a sticky beak at this Chevy. And see how it's all chalky? Well, that's because it's neutralized what was active rust. So before I primed that, before I went, before I go and prime that car when the time comes, I'll um, I'll just sand it all with probably 80 grit on a DA sander just to get rid of all of that loose uh, powdery guff and then 
if there's still areas that are that are brown, that means that there's still active rust, so sometimes you might need to recoat certain areas. But once everything's got that purpley hue, or black if it was really rusty, um, you sand off the loose stuff and then you can just etch prime straight over it with an epoxy or, or whatever etch prime you're using. And you know that you've got neutral steel within a good rust inhibiting paint or some kind of an etching paint uh, on top of it. So that's, that's what I do and I do that inside. If I've taken the quarter panel or a door skin off a car, I'll clean up all of the inside area and, and do that same process, rust convert it. And then even if you use rattle can etch primer, it's still better than what the factory did. Um, so as long as you neutralize the rust and then prime it before you put the, the quarter panel back on and do the same with the inside of the sill or the quarter panel or whatever panel it is that you're replacing. Um, and you'll know that apart from a lot of the times factories had rust catchment areas where you know water and dirt would get in but apart from that you're going to have a lot of life left out of that part of the car because all the surfaces are taken care of. So before I go away I'll just grab a rag and I'll wipe this, this off even though I can still see there's bits of, of rust in there. So it's been about, I don't know, 10 minutes I guess. I've probably been yabbering on for about four or five minutes. Just give that a wipe. Even though normally I'd let it dry off. But this is purely for example reasons. You can see the difference. It's, it's night and day to be honest. And that's purely by using the the OxyTech or any rust converter will generally do the same thing to a certain extent, it's just that I find the OxyTech does it a lot quicker. Um, and like I said before, even though I've cleaned this area, if this was a, well I'm going to use this as a scoop so it'll all get cleaned, but even though that's been sanded, once I'd finished shaping the metal or welding it or doing whatever I was doing to it, I'd then do this process as well, even after cleaning it up. The main reason I do this clean up at the start is just so that I'm working with clean metal, not getting rust all over myself. So, yeah, so that's rust converter. It's uh, extremely useful when it comes to deal with anything that's steel. Um, and especially if you live in a humid climate. If you live in a dry area, you probably don't need to worry about cold rolled steel or any steel that doesn't come painted or zinced or something getting surface rust on it. But where I live, it uh, rust happens very quickly, so these are the sort of steps that I need to take to make sure that my work lasts longer than a week. <laughs> well, you've made it through another whole episode. I uh, hope you learned something from that. Um, if not, at least you get to know that you don't look like me. I have been getting a few questions from you guys and girls, so if I get enough questions that I think might be useful to everyone, um, whether it's fabrication related, personal, music, you know, cars, just anything in general that um, this little community might might enjoy. I might do a, a Q&A episode in the future. Uh, so feel free to ask anything you like and uh, I'll hopefully see you uh, for the next episode. Thanks for watching. Bye.